Before I start, though, I wanted to say, from a field perspective, I'm an old field guy. The work that the states have done with High Path AI, magnificent. I mean, hard work, a lot of effort, a lot of learning and understanding. But it's, it really comes down to, for Washington and for our, for our poultry folks, it's about trade. And they're really serious about trade. And the loss of trade is, is big in, in the poultry industry. It would be the same in the cattle industry or, or swine industry if we had a, a disease that prevented her. So I'm going to talk about it from kind of that angle. So that's enough about that. And I'm going to go back to basics with you. So who cares about avian influenza? There's, there's been low path in the United States for a long time. We have it every year. We deal with it every year. Unfortunately, it carries some of the tra same trade restrictions as high path, which is amazing. And we've been fighting that for many years. So you know there's H proteins and there's N proteins. There's 17 different types of H proteins, and there's 10 different N proteins. The ones we're concerned about, though, are the H5s and the H7s. Why? Because those are the ones that routinely revert to high path. Okay, so those are the ones we really target. When we start to see those, everybody gets nervous. Okay? And we always depopulate them. We don't mess around. And it goes back to when, in 1983, when they had the avian influenza outbreak in the Delmarva Peninsula. There was an H, I think it was an H7 that just hung around and hung around and hung around and never, never converted the, the, and never went high path. And really it's just a, a change of a few amino acids and opening up of the cleavage site so that it becomes high path. It doesn't take a lot. And these things mutate all the time and they borrow things from each other. So if you've got 17 different H types out there floating around, and we don't have all those in the United States, but we have a, a majority of those. And interest, interestingly enough, they circulate in what? Our waterfowl. So you've got a pool of circulating virus out there. You've got a, a low, low path H7, and eventually it converted. It went to an H7 high path, and somewhat like what we're seeing with this H5, things just started to die. There were reports of folks that would visit a farm. They'd, they'd check on the, on the chickens or the turkeys that day. They'd drive away. Within six hours, massive die-offs at those same farms. We, we see the same thing with this. It's, it doesn't take a long time. And, and Dr. Baker spoke about that in his talk this morning with the poultry group, that they didn't, it doesn't take long, it doesn't incubate long, and the next thing you know, things are dying. So we're concerned about the H7s and the H5s. How do we look at poultry in the government? Four basic classes. You've got the large volume commercial poultry. You've got the small volume or high commercial poultry industry which um, we, we look at that separately, but it's still classified as commercial. We've got the live bird marketing system, which we keep a very heavy eye on. We, we do surveillance testing in that. And then we've got the backyard poultry flocks. I left wild birds out, mainly because most countries do not, if you do surveillance for wild birds, they don't penalize you if you've got the virus floating around in wild birds. They're a little funny. Some are, so they're, not supposed to, they're not supposed to put trade restrictions in place for backyard poultry, but some of them will. And the reason is because of the popcorn nature of what we're seeing with this virus. It's like, well, it's popping up here, it's popping up there. You really don't have it controlled, do you, the United States? You don't really know where it's going to come up next. And you're not really, you're not really controlling it. So backyard surveillance is, a, is a, a good tool when you have an outbreak. It's a bad tool to use just re regulatorily because you're going to get penalized for it. So what we, when states ask me, should we be doing backyard surveillance, our answer is always, we're looking in wild birds, we're looking at die-offs. You should be doing surveillance if you have uh, sick bird events and looking at that and testing them. But don't go out and just do general surveillance because you're going to find it. And then you're going you're to restrict your poultry. A little bit about how it's moved around the country, and I gotta catch up to my slides here. So, as we look at what's happened in, in, in high path, this virus and, and the types of this virus, pieces of this virus were circulating out in the, out in the Asiatic flyway since 2014. Really, actually, since some people say, tell us, since 2004, 2006, it's been floating around out there. It's been mixed in. It's been we we've seen reports of H5 HPAI 
Um, in early September in 2014, they had they, uh, the reports in, in this region of H5N1, H5N2, H5N6, H5N8, all high path in China. So we saw all those types out there in 2014 in September. Then we saw the original H5N8 outbreak in January to April of 2014 in South Korea and Japan. After five months with no reported cases, which kind of is similar to what we see in the United States, we had the Pacific Flyway, all of a sudden it went quiet, and then boom, Minnesota, Missouri, Arkansas. So five months they went without anything, and then in September, South Korea had an outbreak in commercial poultry, and again in Japan in November. So um, then we move along to 2015, and we see outbreaks in, of H5N2, H5N3, H5N8 occurring in Taiwan in 2015. So then, what's going on in Europe at the same time, or a little later? It appears next in Europe, in H5, in Germany, in November of 2014. We see it. They found it in a wild duck. One wild duck. Then H5N8 was found in poultry in the Netherlands, in the United Kingdom, and in Italy in, in mid-December that same year. So if we look at the flyways, and we saw the, that they overlap, and I, I think it was Dr. Baker had a really good slide of the overlap of the flyways. They mix, they match. They're, they're nesting up in the northern uh, parts of, of Russia and Alaska and Canada. You know, they're up there during the summer. And as soon as the fall comes and they, they push, the weather pushes them south, and I mean the weather pushes them south, the wildlife experts told us, oh, they're all in, they're all in their summer nesting grounds. They aren't. And we have domestic, we have, we have resident wildlife, geese, ducks, that never fly south anymore you know, because of, I don't know, any open water or they're being fed by people, but we have them everywhere. So they're mixing their viruses with the ones that never fly south. Some are flying south. We know we had high path in Mexico. So we just have a mixing bowl of high path around the country. So as you look at these flyways, you see that there's good reason to, to, to worry. Now, what we also saw with this virus was it's highly adaptable to dabbling ducks. It doesn't kill them. So they can fly with it. They don't get sick, and they spread it to other water birds. Other waterfowl are dying from this, this virus, but not all of them. Interestingly, that it kills raptors. You would think a raptor would be a bird that could eat a dead duck or a dead water bird without dying from the virus, but it kills, it kills them. We know that from what happened in Washington with our jury falcons. Did I say that right? Jury, is it? Gear falcons. Interesting case there. You know, they're supposed to be able to eat just about anything, and they're geared for it, but I think they're more geared for bacteria than viruses, and this, this virus kills them. Kills uh, other types of water birds, too, shorebirds. But the dabbling duck seems to be very well host adapted to it, and they're pretty much being the ones incriminated for how they're spreading it. So then um, we go past Western Europe, and we start to look at the United States. In North America, we see H5N2 was first isolated, as Dr. Baker said, in British Columbia in November, about November 30th of 2014. And then the outbreak continues, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it moved across. Um, we isolated it. We isolated an H5N8 in December 10th of 2014 in captive wild birds in Washington. That was our first indication. We expected it. Everybody was asking us, well, what are you going to do? British Columbia has it. British Columbia wasn't really doing wild bird surveillance, so we didn't know where well, there was no indication. It was when Washington found it in the wild birds that everybody started to say, hmm, Maybe we should be looking more closely at those. And, you know, it's not, it's not just in commercial birds. So that was our first indication. So our story needed to change. And what we were telling Congress and what we were telling the poultry industry is, hey, it's, it's, it's in wild birds. It's probably in the flyway. Is it in the Pacific flyway? Is it in the central flyway? Is it in the Mississippi? We don't know. Our surveillance at the time concentrated on the Pacific flyway, and we looked there exclusively. <coughs> so you put your money where you think the problem is first. If you don't have a lot of money, you concentrate it. That's what we did. 
And we found more of it as we began to look. As Washington was looking at sick bird calls, as Oregon started to do the same, we started to find more virus. So the key one I think that Dr. Baker pointed to in, in his earlier talk was when, when there was an H5N1 isolated in December in a wild duck in Washington. This really, this was the virus in, in Asia that, in China, that stimulated, there were deaths because of it, that stimulated all the talk with the um, Health and Human Services folks and um, CDC. And, and we, we, we were sort of at odds with them in the explanation of this because it's an H5, it's now we found an N1. But to our knowledge, up to this point, these H5N1s, excuse me, H5N8s and H5N2s, there's been no human infection with these viruses. That doesn't mean that it couldn't mutate, convert, and cause a problem. But if we even look at the H5N1 and you look at the medical reports and study those, you'll see that a lot of the folks that died from that, it, it has to do with how you raise your poultry and how you live with your poultry. They live with their, they live with their birds, literally in the house, over the house, under the house. And most of the folks that died of H5N1 exposure didn't die of H5N1, they died of pneumonia. They inhaled massive quantities of virus, secondary bacterial and uh, infections set in, and they actually died of consolidated lungs and, and pneumonia. If you see the x-rays, it'll show you, and it's really interesting. But I think sometimes the CDC sees this as, as and I'm not being critical of the CDC, but if there's a human infection, it's billions of dollars. If there's a poultry infections, it's millions of dollars. We saw that in the money that was given out at, for, for um, the H5N1 scare. CDC made, re literally got funded in the billions of dollars, and they gave, I think, 17 or 18 million to, no, I'm sorry, 60 million to, to USDA to deal with the disease. So I'm going to move on. Again, the flyways. If we're taking a look, you can see the overlap. The red here on this on the uh, on the right side of the slide overlaps with the flyways, and we tell we 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 sat down and briefed Congress about this because Congress was like, well, how do we get it? Why do we have it? And why didn't why didn't you go to Asia and stop it? Those are the kind of questions that you get, and it's like, well, you know, we were aware of the problem, we were watching for it, and we were looking for the indications, and we got them, so. Well, now what can we do? Well, we're not going to wipe it out of, out of wild birds. So, as Dr. Baker said, the only chance we have is to lock things down. And we're doing that. And education, and we're doing that. But it's not enough. I, I was at Exotic Newcastle Disease, and we, we spent, just on outreach, we spent about $6 million during that outbreak, just on commercials and... We found that it was, and someone asked a question about, did you go to the feed meals? And the feed stores were where most people got their information. They went in the feed stores because they trusted them. They didn't use a veterinarian, couldn't afford it, and they felt like the feed, feed stores and the feed meals had the best information. So we had to start getting information out to them. We had to speak in many languages. But what worked best for us, to, and this is curious, is to go to the churches. Because most of these people that we weren't reaching the Hispanic population were religious. They'd go to church, but they didn't want to listen to the government. So we went to the churches, we posted our stuff, and we took the message out that way. And that's how we reached them. Commercials, spent a ton of money on TV. So these are the kinds of things that you just have to do sometimes. And it's different avenues that you never think of that, that, you, that you use and that are successful. And all the problems that Dr. Baker talked about, all the mistakes you make, I always say this, in an outbreak situation, invite everybody to the table because it's the guy that you don't invite that throws rocks at your house. I'm telling you. Let them decide if they want to be there or not. But sometimes you don't even know who they are to invite them. And you're thinking, you just go, well, I forgot. I didn't know about them. I would have, you know, it's nothing, it's not a slight. It's nothing personal. But bring them to the table. Let them, let them decide. We had a similar problem. Los Angeles County. I have some of the best epidemiologists in the world that I think that work for USDA, for veterinary services. So we were doing our own epi. Well, the Department of Health at, in Los Angeles County, they got their nose out of joint right away because we didn't invite them to the table. And they came and criticized us. 
So we, we, we invited them in. We had a session. We sat down, showed them what we were doing. They went away. We kept inviting them. They never came back. But they didn't criticize us after that. So we're moving on. So I'm going to just capsulize what we saw in the U.S. And, and I'm mostly concentrating on the commercial flocks. So on December 14th, we had a confirmation of a H, H, HPAI H5 avian influenza in Whatcom County, Washington. And at the same time, just a little later in Winston, Oregon. In Washington, there were two separate virus strains that were identified. They had an H5N2 that was in a backyard flock, and then the H5N8 that was in the, the captive wildlife. In Oregon, they had a high path H5N8, so um, it was found also in a backyard flock. If we talk about the origin, we've already kind of went over this. It's an Asian strain that mixed with the Euro it was a Eurasian mix that came to the United States well adapted in the dabbling ducks. Again, no human cases. Although in our literature, if you read it, it still says there have been no human cases. However, if we remain vigilant and concerned that we need to watch it for human for, for it to change and the possibility that humans could become infected. This isn't the Spanish flu. And I think a lot of people want to point to that. And if you, I was at a seminar and one of the epidemiologists said that more people die of common flu every year than these strains that they're worried about that are going to be progenitors that are going to come out of Asia. And so I thought that was, that was really interesting. And the Spanish flu killed a lot of folks. I remember uh, my mom even talking about it when, it, it when she would, she lost a sister to the Spanish flu. But if you talk about the vaccination that we got this year, would they say it's 20% effective? How many of you got a vaccination for flu? Anybody get the flu? Yeah, so I didn't get it either, but, you know, 20%, that's not that good. I hope they do better. So subsequent detections. I'll tell you when, the, when it really hits the fan in D.C. is when commercials get involved. And so we saw... On the 23rd, our first commercial flock in Stanislaus County. I spent a lot of time in California during E&D, so I know Stanislaus County. And um, while there's not a lot of poultry in Stanislaus County, if you go to the Tehachapi Mountains and get in the Central Valley, there's a lot of poultry there. And you know, and, and that's we were very concerned during E&D that that area does, doesn't become infected. So what happens in commercial poultry? Well, just the same as we handle a backyard flock. Facilities quarantine. We we whenever we always ask the state, do you need help? We don't want to impose ourselves. If they tell us we got to handle, we don't need you, we stay out. But we offer the joint incident command. We send we send an incident management team, as Dr. Baker said. We're there to help. You know, we don't need to be on the ground. We trust the states to tell us what they're doing. And but if they they want to join incident command, if they need the personnel, if their personnel are exhausted. And as Dr. Baker talked about in his talk this morning with Paul, your folks get exhausted. We have a lot of folks, but we don't have, we have a lot more than this, most states do. We don't have enough to deal with huge outbreaks, which we saw in END. Our people got exhausted too. They were rotating in every, every three weeks. They'd come in, they'd work 18 days, process out three days, stay home for, for 10 days, and then come back. They did that for nine months, and that's that's the, what would happen in a big outbreak. So we we lock things down jointly. We we don't have we have quarantine power federally, but it's a big deal because if we put a federal quarantine on, we got to have a way to get it off. So we rely on the states to either put movement restrictions on or some type of quarantine to keep those to lock that flock down so it's not moving. And most states do have those authorities. I think, Dr. Baker, you had to go for a special emergency authority to do that, right? So not every state has it. So we, kill, we killed these birds, these commercial birds. They foamed them. It's not the best way to kill all birds. There's different methods. Um, we use a lot of CO2 at, during exotic Newcastle disease for big egg-laying flocks. That works good. Um, the foam works good for birds on the ground if you can contain the foam. If you can't, it's not a good, not a good tool. So there's different ways. Once the birds are down, you can compost them. You, you can um, haul them. You can render them. 
if you use proper biosecurity, you can haul them to, to landfills if they'll take them. A lot of landfills won't take them. They say, no. I ran into that during uh, the low path outbreak in the Shenandoah Valley in, uh, in 2001. They just were, they refused to take them. And we, we, they take, they take them to, until they get capacity and then they say no. So we did everything. We burned those birds. We, we buried them. We composted them. We ag bagged them. I mean, any process you could think of, we used during that outbreak to get rid of birds. And if we had a massive outbreak, a lot of these companies and these farms, they don't want to compost on site because they, they cannot go back into production until that, that's taken care of. And so a lot of them want to get, get it moved, get their, get their facility C and D and get back into production. And then surveillance. A lot of confusion around surveillance. Surveillance that we dictate to the states is based on trading partners and what they're asking for. When we had the high path in Texas, Japan asked for a 20, 25 mile surveillance zone. That's pretty ridiculous, but we did it so we could open that up. And that doesn't mean if you finish your surveillance and you do everything, our, our initial process with our trading partners is lock things down, Tell them that the herd, the flock is locked down. Get the surveillance, at least the initial surveillance around that flock done as quickly as possible so you can report that, and that shrinks the zone. A lot of our trading partners are like, as soon as you do the epi, as soon as you tell us where the infection is and you're not confident in that, we'll go from limiting your whole state to limiting maybe that just that zone. So that's why we push that to get done so quickly, and that's why it's important. And uh, different different countries have different... Um, requirements. The other thing I'll tell you, and quite honestly, is even though we meet some countries' requirements, they may not lift their trade bans on us for years. China's famous for that. They, uh, I think Minnesota just got off of quarantine, and so did Virginia and West Virginia just before these outbreaks, and then bang, they're right back. California's been under, quarant- under um, restriction because of low path as far as China's concerned forever. They just won't take... And that, that's a problem because we ship probably 90% of the hatching eggs and, and, and genetic stock ship, ships out of the United States to other countries. So we have the parent stock, the grandparent stock, and we ship out. As, as Dr. Baker said, the West Coast is very important for that shipping. And a lot of, a lot of countries have said, I don't want them transshipped. They can't cross into that state. So that limits. California was out. Oregon was out. Washington was out. Where do you go? Well, they started talking about Utah and Nevada to transship these birds so they could get them out. Well, then, then Nevada pops. So I'm moving on. So currently, we deal with the detections related to, occur- to occurrences of the virus in wild birds. That, that just is for us, the wild bird surveillance is a key. If you start seeing it in wild birds, you better really be locking things down. Um, since we since we found it in the wild birds, and Washington was key because they they sort of sort of paved the way. They showed us showed us it was coming, so it was early warning. Then we started seeing it after after Washington. We saw, it in, of course, in California. Then it, all of a sudden, it's in the Mississippi Flyway. We found it in Minnesota, Missouri. In Arkansas, the California, and, and you know what? The interesting thing was, all of the all of the commercial were in turkeys, or in the one California flock was turkeys, chickens, and ducks. But the interesting part of that is, if you think about, and I saw a picture that Dr. Baker had of how turkeys and broilers are raised. Think about the facility. How's it? What, what's it? What's it look like? It's curtain sides, most of them. We haven't had any outbreaks in egg layers. Think about that. Just, just want you to think about these things. So you get a virus that's not very well distributed in wild birds. It's kind of haphazard. But every one of these breaks that we saw in commercial, there was some association with waterfowl or close to water. The waterfowl grazed in the grass close to the facility. Those curtains come down, and it's hot air. What does hot air do when there's cold air outside? What does cold air do? How's the virus carried? It's a large droplet virus, right? So that means it has to have moisture to survive. It dries out fairly readily. But on a cold, wet, windy day, 
Curtains come down, virus goes in. It doesn't take, it only takes one bird to infect the rest. And if you, if you think about it like this, you gotta, you ever been to a nursery where there's kids, and you take your kid to daycare. You take him there, one kid's got the sniffles. Oh God, it's gonna go through the whole place, and usually the instructors are gonna get it too. Everybody's going down with it. It's the same with AI and, and chickens and turkeys. They spread it like wildfire. They, they manufacture it, and things begin to die. Here's a picture of what we've seen in the United States. And I haven't talked about Kansas. Kansas had a backyard flock of chickens that we just recently had, and it was high path, and we took it out, or, or in the process of taking it out. But you can see, if I'm an international trading partner, and I'm looking at this map, and you're telling me, hey, we got this under control, are you believing me? Yeah, there's a lot of spots, and there's a lot of... And, and what my boss says to me, he goes, I ain't buying it. You know, if I'm a foreign trader, trading partner, I'm looking at this saying, you don't know where it's going to come up next. And what we're saying to everybody, and I'm, I'm telling Congress this, I was just up there Friday testifying, and I said, these are point source outbreaks. We have no evidence of spread amongst companies, spread in feed, Lateral spread, we're not seeing it. They're point source outbreaks. So that means they're being exposed, point source. We believe it's the wild waterfowl. We believe we're going to continue to see this as long as it's in the wild waterfowl. There's going to be these point source outbreaks. We've seen the same thing with low path, but no one got excited about that. Low path in 2012 started over on the East Coast, did like a U. It went down and went up to Minnesota. You guys remember that? Nobody got excited. Same thing. But this is high path, and it kills birds, and it kills them fast. And like I said, we, the, probably the only saving grace with high path is it, 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 it tells you it's there. Low path, it can be there. We don't see the death, and it can spread. And interestingly, low path can at times kill turkeys and chickens too. In the Shenandoah Valley in 2001, 2000, it killed those birds. It was low path. But they were breeders and they were probably stressed because they were under heavy production and they didn't have very good immunity. And other things probably with the low path set in and they just died. So here's a summary of what we've seen in the dates in the counties where we saw it. Uh, with the, with the, uh, and look down the, the, the column that um, this, right here. And this is what I mentioned before. Turkey flock, turkey flock, turkey flock, turkey flock. Commercial chicken and duck, turkey flock. Facility. That's a facility issue to me. And I've been in poultry a long time, and I've seen a lot of things. And I think the facilities, they're, they're perfect for raising those birds because turkeys grow well when they're cool. They don't like heat. When they're small, they do. But as they're growing up, it's better to keep them cool. So they got those computers raising in those, those curtains to keep a certain temperature in there, and that's an issue. But you can't lock them down either. They gotta have fresh air. And look at how we build our poultry houses. Poultry house here, intake, outtake. Poultry house here, intake, outtake. Have you ever seen ILT go through a facility? It, it just travels. If once it gets in, in one facility, because of the way our fans are situated in the building, it'll just travel through the whole facility. And it's, it's intensive ag agriculture. And when, when nothing's there, when there's no disease, it's great. But when the disease is there, it's a problem. So, regulatory action. Our trading partners look to see, well, what are you doing? You know, in the United States, somebody said, well, why did Canada, Canada restrict us? Because they don't want to take any, they want to get any more of it, right? They've got a problem, they want to clear it up, they want to, they want to tell the OIE, hey, we've taken care of it, we're 90 days out, take the restrictions off so that our other trading partners will start to trade with us again. But if they're taking poultry and stuff from us and we're, we're, we're still having problems, other countries look at that too. They ask us, well, what restrictions, when Canada first had their problem, what restrictions did you put on Canada? So we negotiate with countries, and that's part of the process. We negotiate with countries to set up regulatory zones enforcement zones, and, and so that we understand their inf veterinary infrastructure, they understand ours, and we work together. And I'm going to talk about later on what trade, what trade 
what that does for trade and what that's enabled us to do and what it's not enabled us to do. So people talk about, well, what about what's the OIE say? Office of International Epizootics, they're the, they're the standard setting body for veterinary medicine internationally, right? They sort of say, these are the things you need to do to declare yourself free. These are the things you need to do for other countries to trust your infrastructure. So we work with them, we notify them, and we notify them when, on each of these cases of commercial poultry, we notified them. We didn't have to because once you get a case, they consider each additional case just an ongoing part of that infection. But we wanted to make sure that they knew and that they were keeping the time scale. And on the backyard flocks, we don't have to notify them. We do have trading partners, though, that say, if you get a backyard flock, we want to know. And then they'll make a decision whether they're going to restrict you or not. Okay? So we, we immediately try to, with all these HPIA cases, we try to lock them down. We try to get in there, get them quarantined, get them depopulated. Most cases we depopulated within just a few days after discovering the case. And that's, that takes cooperation between the states and the feds and the owners. We had one owner that wanted to argue about price for indemnity. We had a calculator that tells us what those birds are worth. He had a house that had, I think it was 10,000 birds in it. When, he first, when they first not notified us that they had, they had 500 birds die in that house. He wanted to argue with us about price. He waited three days. By the time it came time to t depopulate that house, there was only 500 birds left. They'd all died. We don't pay for dead birds. People don't understand indemnity either. Indemnity is a process that we use so people will report disease. It's not intended to make the owner whole. It's not intended to pay them for their losses. It's an eradication tool. It's to eradicate disease. We're only paying for the diseased birds. If they're already dead, we don't need to pay for them. They're dead. Okay, And that's the way the government looks at it. It's very harsh, but it's the way it is. Now, if this was cattle and you got TB, I've had many cattle owners hold me up for months under quarantine just saying, hey, I think they're worth more than that. I'm not going to depopulate. If, that does, if TB would kill all those animals like High Path does, they wouldn't negotiate. And it's really not supposed to be a negotiation. It's this is what we pay fair market value. This is what they're worth. Okay? What's a dead bird worth? In the government's eyes, nothing. So that's the way we process it. Okay? Okay. So what's our message? And what's the state's message? And what's the poultry industry's message? Bio security, bio security, bio security. You know, it's funny. When I was out at in the Shenandoah Valley, they had trucks, feed trucks, and they had, um, on those trucks they had uh, spray rigs that would spray the tires off when they went on and off the poultry premises. Well, they hadn't had disease in a long time, so they stopped using them. Oh, my God, it's so easy. Just flip a switch, put your water in there. They stopped using them. So people get lax when there's not disease, and their biosecurity practices, they just kind of get lazy. And biosecurity is expensive. But this disease is a lot more expensive than that. So what do we do when we find it? We have a process, and we, got, we get beat up on this all the time, too. People want to know, but if it's you and, and you're trying to deal with it in your state, you don't want us telling everybody before you're ready to have everybody know. So what we do is we have a non-lab, the non-lab concept. You guys all know about non-lab, right? We use the non-labs on the initial samples, and they've been great. I mean, without them... Uh, Therefore, expanded capacity, and that's the way we built the system. Without them, we'd be in real trouble. So the initial samples often go to the non-lab because they're usually got a non-lab in their state. They test them. They get what we call as a presumptive positive. Well, right now, that's a, we found an H5. It's a matrix H5. We think it's, we think it's the real deal. But we still don't know if it's high path or what the N-type is. Okay? So that sample is bundled up and shipped to NVSL. In the government's eyes, in, in, in the federal government's eyes, it's not positive until we say it's positive. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the non-lab got; it's a good indicator because it lets the state vet know I got a problem. Maybe I better start moving on it. I better start locking things down, and I better play on the safe side. I don't care if it's high path or low path. It's an H5. I'm going to lock it down. Then it goes to NVSL. PCR takes a day. Okay, they'll confirm it as H5. <clears throat> Now we've gone to genomic sequencing. That takes another day, if it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. 
So, but we're on top of that. So that's, we go from the presumptive to NVSL. Within 24 to 48 hours, we've got a positive, if it's a positive. We know the sequence, we know it's high path, we know the end type. Two days is a lot of time when you're dealing with high path, though. It's a nervous time. So a lot of states, I can tell you if this was in the Delmarva Peninsula, they'd lock it down right now, and they'd start killing those birds. They wouldn't care what NVSL found, because they aren't going to risk it. There's too high a density, you've got too much poultry. So they lock it down. That's the way it works. We, when we get that presumptive positive, we're talking to the state. We're talking to the industry. Once we get, and, and once we get the positive positive, the confirmation, that, that notice goes out to everybody simultaneously. They all get it at the same time, same day. Because we had a little issue with a snowstorm, and we were closed. Nobody went to work that day. So we were a day late getting the information out. We got criticized by that, about that. And, and probably rightfully so, but our process for notification was there. We'd followed all the steps, but part of our process is we have to tell our undersecretary and our secretary that there's a positive. Well, the notification had gone to the undersecretary. This was the, the, on the, uh, I think it was on the Missouri flock. It, no, it was Minnesota flock. Gone to the undersecretary gone to the secretary, they had not cleared it. And we waited four hours. Four hours. In the meantime, the trading partners had been told, hey, there's a, there's a high path in, in Minnesota. So the poultry industry knows it now because the trading partners know. So they come into the state vet's office and they start chewing his ear. How come you didn't tell us? Why, why didn't you know? Well, he didn't know because we didn't tell him. And so, so things get out of sync sometimes. People are so busy trying to tell the trading partners and get things cleared with them, then they don't, they haven't let the other piece. So now it all goes at once. We're, you're never going to see that again where the trading partners know, but the state vets don't know, because that, that's just not going to happen again by the, by the way we have the system set up. So I wanted to tell you that because I, I was the one on many of the calls that, that dealt with uh, notifications and the lack thereof when we had a problem. So trade, this is just a little bit, of, it adds to what Dr. Baker said. And these are uh, 2014 numbers, and I got them from uh, Foreign Ag Services. So this is just on, on what, we're, what we ship, okay, for exports. So you look at broiler meat, that's our biggie. 63% of our exports in the poultry industry are broiler meat. About 3% are live poultry. Turkey meat's about 12%. Eggs and egg products is about 10%. And then other poultry is in the 12% range. So remember, broiler meat's the biggie, okay? So the share of the uh, of U.S. broiler production by state, and some of your states are here. Um, Georgia's 15%, Arkansas 12 North Carolina 12 Alabama 11 and then the other states make up the other 50%. Well, we got, you can see when it got in the central flyway, people started to get nervous because there's a lot of poultry there. If you look at the millions of metric tons, the red line at the top, you can see that we export, uh, in a good year, about three, 3 million metric tons of, of broiler meat. And as you can see, over the years, our, our production has been slowly climbing. So the forecast for 2015 was we're going to produce 4% more than we produced the year before, but we'll probably export 3% less. Why was that probably... They probably said that because Russia shut us off and China's been messing with us for I don't know how long. So that was before we even had the outbreaks. Okay. So let's talk about what, what these countries did. If you look at what actually happened in, in, and has happened since the outbreak, you can see that uh, there's different ways countries de dealt with it. 23% of the exports, or of our, of our exports, they, and the countries we export to said no restrictions. They didn't care. Probably because their infrastructure wasn't very good. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And they probably already had it and thought, what the heck? We'd rather have the food to eat. We don't want to worry about the restrictions. Some, some countries, and I'll talk about those in a minute, 
11% said, we're going to put a national ban on everything from the United States. Don't want any of it. Oh, what happened? We lost it? Oh, it's my fault. Yeah, I had my hand on it. <laughs> I unhooked you. I didn't really see that slide anyway. Will it come back up? Okay, so, yeah, so 11% said national restrictions. We don't want you to, we don't want, we don't want any of your poultry. But the interesting part is 66% of the country said, we're going to deal with your infrastructure. We trust you. We're going to, we're going to regionalize based on what you tell us. And 60%, 66% said, they'll go with it. So, one of the last things I wanted to, to run through, and, I, and this is just a site where you can find out currently what's going on in, in high path AI across the United States. <clears throat> 